last week, uh, for those of you who are here, I uh, was telling about a position. I Actually, it was my first career. It was in public relations, and I worked at Ogilvy & Mather. You remember the leisure becomes you story. <laughs> and for those of you who weren't here, just briefly, that um, I had gone to Africa, and I just had my heart and soul blown wide open. You know, I was in a completely different kind of space when I came back, and I just didn't really fit there anymore. And I was meeting across from the executive director, and she said, leisure becomes you. And I, you know, she wasn't really seeing, really. She didn't have a context for, for what had happened inside of me. It wasn't about going on a nice vacation. But anyway, so skip forward. In my next career as um, in education, I worked at the Teachers Academy for Mathematics and Science, and we were on fire to reform the Chicago public school system. <coughs> It was an amazing organization, so much diversity. I've never been in such a just balanced, diverse place. And so it was a really exciting place to be. And the, the executive director there was Lourdes Montiagudo. And um, I was, you know, a young woman. I was really looking for mentorship. And so here there's a brilliant woman who's running this organization. And she's just fabulous at strategic thinking and politics and networking and and you know, super smart, and she has goals of her own that she talks about being the school superintendent and so on. And, and so this is really somebody I thought, I can really learn from this person, you know? And sometimes we learn from what a person does really well, and sometimes we learn from what a person doesn't do so well, you know? <laughs> and it turns out that's really kind of the package that I got there. And um, Lourdes was... Um, really, uh, in, in many ways, the epitome of the kind of leadership we don't want to have, which was very armored kind of leadership, kind of top-down, you know, all one-way communication. We would all be called into a meeting, and for four hours, Lourdes would speak, and nobody else would say anything. And if you tried to, you just sort of get run over, you know? So we'd, you know, somebody would raise their hand and say, hey, can we go to lunch? <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and she also would sometimes shame people. And so it was, it was hard, you know, it was really hard, especially when, you know, there was just so much good happening there, you know, but, but there are reasons why we go into armor. And we're going to go into that a little bit today as we begin this series on, spir on spiritual leadership, really a kind of wholehearted leadership. How many of you consider yourself a leader? A lot of you. Fabulous. So, and, and you may have raised your hand, or I guess I'll just ask you, those of you who raised your hand, at what point did you consider yourself a leader? What happened that caused you to shift over into, I'm a leader now? Other people told you, and that's often what happens, right? Did you want to say something today? Yes, okay. <laughs> So, so there are two great examples. Somebody told you you're a leader or somebody, or you got into a formal kind of leadership role. And then you kind of owned the idea that I'm a leader, right? And yet, if we work with a definition that we're going to work with throughout this series that Brene lays out for us in Dare to Lead, it is this. Leadership is not about titles, not about status. It's not about wielding power. Leadership or a leader is anyone who takes responsibility for recognizing potential in people and ideas and has the courage to develop that potential. So now I bet those of you who didn't raise your hand, either you might not have because you just didn't want to, but who didn't identify yourself as a leader a few moments ago, might now with that working definition see something different. Because we, especially as spiritual beings on this path, I mean, this is our second principle, right? Acknowledging the divine nature in one another. That's about potential, isn't it? Seeing the Christ potential in one another, the, the possibilities in one another, seeing the spiritual qualities in one another and calling them forth, naming them, bringing them out into the light of day. And seeing it in ourselves, too. Seeing the potential in an idea. Somebody has a great idea. You know, how often do we rush in to crush it? Oh, yeah, we've done that before. That doesn't work. You know, before anybody really gives it some, some breath, right? Some life, some chance. 
some possibility. And so it's that, that kind of leadership we're talking about that holds open possibility, that sees potential, and not just sees it, but names it, calls it out. That's a key part of it too, you know? How often have you thought something really nice about somebody and you just didn't say it? Out of a kind of shyness, out of a fear of maybe being rejected, it wouldn't be received or whatever it was. And, and the call to courageous leadership is to, if you spot it, Say it. <laughs> if you see it, call it forth. Particularly the things that have that kind of um, potentiality and possibility in them, the kinds of things that can really rise up in somebody, that are really aligned with the divine, the spiritual attributes that we all want to embody and be in the world. And I bet for all of us, you know, who, if you think about a, a leader in your life, somebody who called you forth, who impacted you, that that, you know, if you think about the coaches or the mentors, the teachers, the parents, or all the people, bosses, people who have somehow influenced your life in a positive way, it's probably a, a part of what they did, or a, really maybe a, a singular focus of what they did, was to be able to call forth the, the future, the potential in you, the, the best in you that you, might have, that, that you may not have seen. And sometimes it's for us to call it forth in ourselves as well. So what we're talking about in this series is wholeheartedness, because that's really the kind of leadership we're after, right? As spiritual leaders and as, and as beings on a spiritual path, what we really want to embody is a kind of wholehearted type of leadership. So it's a different kind of courage than maybe going out and climbing a mountain or something like that, you know, or fly, or you know, jumping out of an airplane or something you think of like, wow, that really takes some courage, you know, and that does take a kind of courage. But I find that the toughest, the, the deepest, the thing that calls up courage at the deepest level within me is the kind that is the courage of the heart. Anybody else find that too? It's the risks that we take with our own hearts that are the great risks in the world, that are the ones that really can blow up on possibilities for other people as well as ourselves, for entire cultures of organizations and communities, of families and, and neighborhoods even, of cities and beyond countries. There's so much possibility when we are, see ourselves as leaders and step into it with courage and, and go forward to speak the truth that we see when we see it. So Brene is a social scientist and she studied a lot of different leaders in different ways and, and she and her team did all kinds of, I, I don't even know, she doesn't really even talk about a lot of the methods and so on, but she has pretty extensive research processes before they come to a conclusion. And so the question that they were holding in their interviews was, what if anything about the way people are leading today needs to change in order to experience success in our rapidly changing environment? So that was the question that they asked all kinds of folks, and m mostly people who were in formal leadership positions, but others as well. And the answer that they got is that what we need is brave leaders and courageous cultures across the board. That was ultimately what the, all the research bore, was we need brave leadership and courageous cultures. And so what does that look like? What does it look like to be in a courageous culture? What does it look like to be a courageous leader? Well, what we would see in a courageous culture is tough conversations are had. They're not hidden from. We don't nice and polite them away. You know, oh, well, that's not nice to say, or that wouldn't be a polite conversation to have. Because that's just a, an easy excuse, right? I see Paula and Jim who are <laughs> going to have a workshop uh, just after the, the service about having tough conversations. And so this is a form of leadership, right, where we're willing to, in a kind of vulnerability, that we're willing to have those tough conversations that we maybe would much rather, you know, go to the dentist than have, right? <laughs> And sometimes those tough conversations also have the flavor of inclusivity and diversity that often we will avoid those vital conversations because we're afraid we'll say the wrong thing. Anybody ever do that? We're afraid we might not be politically correct, so we might as well just stay out of it completely. 
but it, it, we can't do that anymore, right? If we really want the kind of courageous cultures that are infused with the kind of spirituality that we all hold in our minds and hearts, then we must be willing to have those vital conversations and to make mistakes. We will make mistakes. What courageous person has done what they've ever done without making mistakes? That's a part of the journey. Or without feeling fear, that's just a part of it. That's why we call it courage. <laughs> you know, courage comes from the root word of courage is core, which is heart. So this wholeheartedness is very much a part of the courageous leadership path. Another kind of thing that we would see in a courageous culture or embodied in a courageous leader, besides the ability to have these kinds of tough conversations and not avoid them, is somebody who will take risks with bold ideas, with innovation. So when, so it's a kind of culture where if bold ideas come up or, or new ideas, they aren't immediately thwarted by no, that's not the way we do things around here, or, or a criticism, or a, you know, a kind of a, a block of resistance, you know? But a willingness first to look and to see and to talk about and to, and to see what, you know, put it into a field of possibility rather than an impossibility immediately, right? So it's that kind of flavor that you get in a community or a place that has really bred courageous culture. There's many other things. Things like connection and empathy are rampant through uh, this kind of culture that really works, this kind of culture that is the kind of culture that is being called for in today's world, where there is a sense of connection and play, where exhaustion isn't rewarded, but there is, there is a sense of balance in people's lives, and we know a little bit about each other's lives beyond the workday, and if it's a work situation. So, so there, there's that sense of we are connected to one another and we're working together as a team, and everybody's being honored in various ways. So those are some of the things. There's more, you know, we're, we're more about holism than perfectionism, which is kind of another flavor of, um, of the other, and also a time, a, a place in which we don't rush in to sort of, you know, come up with some unsustainable, quick fix solution when a problem arises, but it's a little bit more thoughtful than that. And there's a little bit more ease to, instead of the sort of, you know, urgent emergency kind of, kind of uh, tense kind of response system. More of a breathe <laughs> and expand, a look and see, a pray, let's pray about this. I mean, that's it, you know, when I, I talk to my friends or to Brendley about their work environments, and I just say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, God, that <laughs> I'm in a place where meetings start with prayer, and, you know, we hug each other, you know, I mean, there's just a whole different kind of world we live in in unity, and sometimes I, I realize I can sometimes live in a bubble, so for those of you who are out in the world, <laughs> beyond our unity bubble, and bringing it forward, thank you because it takes courage for you to bring that kind of connection and empathy and bravery into the world and carry those spiritual qualities. They're noticed, they make a difference. And I know that all of you are doing that in many different ways. So a great gift to the world. So what stands in the way for us from becoming a courageous leader? What causes us to to stop, you know, we've named a few of the things. I mean, in, in essence, it's us, right? <laughs> we stand in the way, and we stand in the way in different ways. You know, it might be that, that we're kind of resistant. We have a resistant energy to change, or we're fearful of change, or we're fearful of other things. And those things kind of hold us back. But wherever you find those places that are kind of, you know, bumping up against or resisting in you, then, then the spiritual teachings of non-resistance and surrender are really helpful. In fact, there's an old school book by Imelda Shanklin, an old school unity book um, called What Are You? And one of the, in, in my early classes in unity, one of the assignments was to read the chapter on non-resistance every day for 21 days. It's really good. <laughs> so if you, if you want to take on, if resistance is something you're, you're coming up against and you want to take this idea on, I recommend that as, as one of the exercises you could try on. And so that, that is one of the things that come up for us and all the different things that we might resist, these ideas of maybe connection or vulnerability that could come with the tough conversations and so on. And then there's also that 
that insidious thing that hides out in the shadows because that's where it lives and breathes and has its being, and it's called shame. And shame is one of those things that, man, we don't even want to talk about it, right? Brene, talk, she studies it, and so she talks about how she's kind of introverted when she gets on a plane. She doesn't always want to tell people what, what she does for a living, but if she doesn't feel like talking, when they say, what do you do? She says, I study shame. She said, the wall goes right up, <laughs> and I am left alone the entire flight. <laughs> we just don't want to go there because it's... it's because it's shame, right? Shame is shame. You know, shame, the difference between shame and guilt, guilt is we make a mistake. Shame is that we, we think we are in some way the mistake, right? There's a sense of, it comes to the core of our worthiness, right? Our essence, it cuts to the quick. That's why we don't want to talk about it. It's better left in the shadows, we think. But here's the thing about courageous leadership and courageous cultures, out of the shadows. So the, the shame has to come out. It has to be outed. It has to be brought out into the light of day. Now, only we can really do that for ourselves, but what we can do for each other is to bear witness. Father Gregory Boyle gives a great example of this. Father Gregory Boyle is the one who has spawned Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles. He's a priest at the Dolores Mission. His background is in the Franciscan tradition. And he just has a heart of gold. <laughs> and so he's done all this amazing work for ex-gang members and gang members, people that nobody else really wanted to work with. And he's done, and it, it's just really opened up all these lives. And so he tells a story of kind of his typical Saturday would be to give mass at the probation halls in the morning and then come back to Dolores Mission in the afternoon and do whatever baptisms or weddings or things that are on the schedule. On this particular day, he came back, he had about a half hour window before the baptism started. And so he thought, oh good, I have a few minutes to go through my mail. So he's going through his mail and this woman walks in who he's never really talked to face to face, but he knows her well. Her name is Carmen and she sort of owns First Street apparently. Carmen is known because uh, she's super loud. She often is seen stumbling out of the mill to bar after she's arguing with the guys in the bar or she's heard on the payphone, now you know this is dated a little bit, <laughs> where she's yelling at a friend or a relative about just one night, just let me stay for one night over and over again. You know, she's a gang member, she's a heroin addict, she's sometimes a prostitute. Um, so people know her, right? She's a street person, people know her. She makes herself known in ways that people probably want to shy away from. And now here she is in front of Father Gregory, who they call G. And he's thinking when she walks in, oh, I only have 15 minutes before the baptism, I'm not gonna get through my mail, you know? And so she plops down and she says, I need help. She said, I um, went to Catholic school. I graduated from high school, in fact. She said, and that's when I started taking heroin. She said, I've been to 50 rehabs. She said, I'm known all over the country. <laughs> And he said she would kind of like look around his office and she was kind of speaking slowly and deliberately. And she said, and you know, I've been trying to get off heroin since the day I started. And he said, then she leaned her head up against the, the wall that was behind her. And he said, when she looked back up, there were pools of tears and they began to dump down her cheeks. And she said, I, am a disgrace, a disgrace. And he said, my shame met hers. And just a moment ago, I thought that she was an interruption. But here's what Father Gregory Boyle is offering us as courageous leaders, that we don't turn away from shame, that we don't put, put, tuck it back in the the darkness where we'd rather it lived. That we don't not allow somebody else's pain to touch our own pain. Because that's really why we're tucking it back in, you know. Because <laughs> we don't want to feel that in us. He said we have to allow other people's shame purchase in our lives. We have to allow it 
so that we're not trying to fix it, but to feel it. And so it is the call to feel with each other in that beautiful kind of space. Painful, yes. Hard, yes. But the call of a wholehearted leader is to be there in that space and to not shy away or armor up or cover or bury our own pain or try to whisk that person's pain away or affirm it away, which we can do in unity. You know, Sometimes we can be too quick to go to the affirmative place. <laughs> it's not that we don't want to move there, but we have to know in, in our, in our you know, skillful practice, because courage can be taught. These are skills that can be taught, just like our armored ways of being can be unlearned. And with skillful practice, we come to that kind of place where we can sit there, as Father Gregory Boyle is able to and shows us how. So that armor, that idea of armoring up, you know, we, we all at some point or another, you know, have picked up our armor. <laughs> and some of us has con have continued to put on more and more of it, you know, thicker shield, <laughs> better safety goggles, you know, <laughs> a, a full set of armor, you know, better weapons, stronger weapons, you know. And some of us have put some on and take some, and off, some off, you know, gone for a little bit lighter set, you know. <laughs> and so on, but you know, you know armor, right? You've been there before, the closing of the heart, the shutting of the door, the shield in front. And so there's, a, there's an opportunity for us in wholehearted leadership to begin to drop that, to begin to be the one who shows others that it's okay, that it's gonna be okay to move into these places. Cultures that are, are, that are led and, and that kind of breathe an armored kind of leadership, you'll see things like blame and cynicism and judgment and perfectionism and exhaustion and a lot of the things that I named earlier because that's kind of what breeds there. And shame, even though that's usually hidden, but you'll see it come out in sideways ways. And so unearthing this and putting it out into the divine light heals whatever needs to be healed and frees up all kinds of energy, all kinds of innovative creativity, possibility, joy, connection, play. And these are the antidotes to what we're talking about. These are the play and connection will come. You know, when we cover things up, we're not just covering the things up that we don't want to see. We then also cover up these, these places of, of, of joy and play and connection and richness and love. And so the opportunity is to let it out and to let it breathe and to let it breathe through the places that we want to touch in these ways, including ourselves and our own hearts. You know, the um, biblical story of David and Goliath, you know, none of the armed, fully armed army guys, the soldiers wanted to get in the ring with the giant Goliath. But the little boy David said, I'll do it. Please let me do it, because he felt a call from spirit, and he felt a strong faith, the sense of knowing that spirit's got this, that I'm with God at all times. And it's the same kind of call for us when we go into the difficult places in our leadership and in our lives, we can call forth that understanding within us that spirit has got this, is with me all the way that I can bank on my faith, that I can draw confidence from that, that I can know that the right words will come or the heartfelt words will come and they may not be exactly right, but my intentions will come through. That the kind of person I wanna be, the kind of gift I wanna be, the kind of embodied God that I wanna be is available to, to us through this kind of strong faith. And that's what David brought, a whole heart and openness, a willingness, a courage into that ring. And five smooth stones, that was his backup. <laughs> and of course, you know, he faces Goliath, whatever the Goliath is in your life that has come along. You know, this is a great metaphor, right? That, what is that Goliath that is in the arena that is calling you? And when you get in there, you know, what happens? Well, if you go in with your faith and your whole heart, then you will be able to slay that Goliath. And then there will be great celebration everywhere present, all around you, for those you did it for. Because, you know, almost nothing in life, when we're really grounded in spirit, is just for us, right? 
In fact, often we are the sort of the, the secondary beneficiary of, because the, the more we're on the path, the more it is about service, and the more it is about service, it is a sort of sacred offering of spirit into the world over and over again. And that's that kind of wholehearted approach that we offer to one another when we take up this courageous inner call. You know, Michelle, our new youth ministry director, Michelle Chakala, um, was here one day with the kids, as she has often been doing, sharing what they did for the day. And that day, I think, was the day we were wrapping up the four agreements, and they were doing always do your best. And she had asked the kids, what do you do that's, you know, what's the thing that you're really good at? What's something that you do best? And um, Grace, who lives with us, didn't say anything then. But afterwards, at home, she told me that she's really good at drawing. And she is really good at drawing. So we, of course, affirmed that, yeah, you're really good at drawing. And she has a frame that she like, changes out with her drawings, and her drawings have just kind of even blossomed more, and she uses all kinds of bold colors. We even sent them to an art therapist friend who said these are the drawings of an eight or nine-year-old child, and she just turned six. And so we were like, wow, you know, you really, you know, I mean, we don't want to, you know, we just want to like, like, massage it and let it blossom, right? You're sort of like cheerleaders, right? And this is sort of what we offer each other as courageous leaders. We're like guides on the side. We're cheerleaders, you know? We're, we're the ones who say, you can do it. I see this in you. I see your possibility. And how brilliant for Michelle to have the kids name their gifts. Because when we name them ourselves, when you give people an open space to call forth their own gifts, it's so much more potent because you're naming it. You're bringing it out into the world. You're saying, this is something I do really well. And then it just opens up into all kinds of possibilities. So this calling forth of gifts, of what we see in others and giving them space to call it, in themselves, call it forth in themselves and for us to call it forth from our own selves is all about tapping that potential, the potential in us and the potential in our ideas. And the possibilities of what can grow from that are endless, right? Because we're in spirit. The possibilities are, are everywhere present. They are abundantly available to us. When we are in armored le leadership, it's that other kind of feeling. It's that squandered feeling, that constrained feeling, that constricted feeling, the walking on eggshells idea. And so if you are in those kinds of scenarios out in the world in groups or teams or organizations like that, I really want to encourage you one courageous step at a time to bring what you can to be the bright light of day in that place because people are longing for it because it's natural for us because it's who we are as divine beings. It resonates in truth. And truth blows the lid off of everything, doesn't it? Yeah, these are times for truth. And it's a time to take risks. The courageous leadership, of course, is about taking risks. Brene tells a story of when she's at a Costco Global Leadership Summit, and she's going to speak after the CEO. And so the CEO is up there, and he's taking questions from all these different leaders and, and people that are part of the organization. And, and they're asking really tough questions. And she's, she, you know, she does a lot of organizational leadership co coaching. So she said, I've seen this, you know, over and over and over again, where leaders will do these sort of um, non-answers as answers. You know, oh, great question. We'll get back to you on that. You know, <laughs> hey, good idea. Somebody write that down. You know, and then like move on, move on, move on. And she said this guy was so different. And she said the questions were really hard. And he was standing in it and saying, no, we're not going to do that. And I'll tell you why we're not going to do that. Yes, we did do that. We did make that decision. And here's why we made that decision and kind of giving the flushing out the details. And she's sitting there thinking, oh, no, I do not want to follow this because this crowd is bristly. They're getting nothing that they want to hear, you know. And, and so she's so shocked when he finishes and everybody stands up and gives him a standing ovation. And she says to the woman next to her, what's going on? Like, I, they're not getting anything they want and they're all applauding. And the woman says, at Costco, we clap for truth. Isn't that awesome? And I know at Unity, we clap for truth, don't we? Let's do that. <laughs> and the world needs some more truth these days, huh? <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's courageous too, isn't it? Speaking the truth is sometimes cor courageous because it's not always what people want to hear, but the truth is being clear with the truth is the kindest thing we can ever offer. You know, it is truly wholehearted relation or leadership to speak our truth wherever we are, to share what's in our hearts. And you know that that resonant truth lands because we're all human beings. We all have a heart. <laughs> And it lands in that place, and it resonates in that place. You know, Jesus said the truth will set us free. And it does over and over and over again. We see it in all of its forms, from the divine truth, the basic idea of the principles that we hold dear, to the, to the emanations of that in just like honesty and, and, sh and authenticity and, and reliability that people can bank on, that this, that trust that this is a place where, where trusting things happen and I can trust what's going on and I can have faith here and I can have faith that people will do the best they can do and they'll tell me the honest truth of what's going on. That's what we're really breeding and asking for. So in wholeheartedness, we bring all of it, right? We bring wholeness. We bring the inclusivity of all that we are. Even the places, the sort of the, the places that have been sort of, sort of secreted away that, that we're not so proud of, when they get exposed because we're armoring up, well, we just kind of go with it, right? <laughs> Here goes nothing, you know? And just allow the, a little bit of healing to begin with that because there will always be somebody around us, because a big part of shame is we think we're alone. And there will always be somebody around us who will say, like the great movement that began in 2017, me too. And it's an antidote to all of it, isn't it? Me too. And then we sit together in that. And then somebody else says, me too, or me too. And there's some shade that usually we can relate to, even if it's not the very same experience that somebody has said that they have gone through. So what we want to be are people who are leading from heart, not leading from hurt. Because the, that hurt, you know, will, will become that insidious thing that it becomes, that dark thing that it becomes. And we have come here to bring the light, have we not? We have come to be wholehearted. We have come to be courageous leaders. And every single one of us has a call, has that call to be out in the world, to be exposing the truth, speaking the truth, holding the truth, and holding one another in the painful places to connect, to provide empathy, and to shine that bright divine light that we have to shine. The world needs our teachings like nobody's business. And who can bring them but us? So are we in? Are we doing this together? Let's know this together. Let's be the courageous leaders that we are, and let's close out with this, these two affirmations together. I am a courageous leader. I bring my whole heart. So it is.